Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a show in which we talk about what's happening in the news with the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, and some of you might know my other Beatles program, which is syndicated around the world on about 20 radio stations right now, and it's called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my co-host, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner and many other Examiner columns, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Uh, hello, everyone. On the show this time, uh, I think we're going to talk about several things that have happened in the news recently. And uh, in the past week, there's no doubt about it, certainly, uh, well, in my opinion, probably our opinion, the biggest news is that Ringo will be back on the road. Yep. So he, he will be returning in February and doing a tour of North and South America and Latin America. And... I think what's probably equally important to just say that is that it's the same band again. <laughs> yeah. It's the same he really, band. He yeah. really likes his band. And, uh, I, you know, I, I guess it, it's very convenient. That, I mean, the fact that he's able to hold on to all of these guys, especially Todd Rundgren. I mean, you know, because, uh, I mean, Todd Rundgren's got his own career, uh, you know, especially. Um, so that's kind of, you know, that's kind of cool. And also, you know, the fact that uh, he has Warren Ham again working with him. But, uh, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a good band and it's going to be fun. And I'm going to get to see him a second time. That's that's even more interesting. That's so, right, because he's playing in San Francisco when, when he comes back right. to the U.S. But, um, yeah, I, I think that it's it's really fascinating to me. I mean, all these years, and we're talking about now 25 years of the All-Star Band, he's always changed his lineups. But it is true he must really like these group of people. Not that he hasn't loved all the other ones, but for whatever reason, he really enjoys these group of guys. And with the exception of Warren Hamm, who is filling in for Mark Rivera as music director, right. it's the same group of guys. And it is kind of miraculous in a way because most of the people who have been in Ringo's All-Stars are people who, on a regular basis, tour for the most part. Because right. that's how they make their living. That's, you know, more so than the sales of whatever new records they might make. Right. This, this, is, this is their livelihood. And for many of these people, you may not be aware of the fact that they're always touring. So for Ringo to be able to hold on to the same group of people, he must know that there's a window there when they're not touring on their own. And I do know for a fact, Todd, you mentioned in particular, Todd tours all the time. Right. Todd always puts out new albums. He always does different tours. He can do several different tours in the same year. And he does have a new album coming out around March. And he is supposed to tour around then. But he knew that if Ringo calls him, he tries to to, uh, to pattern or, or schedule himself around Ringo if he can. Because he uh -huh. loves working with Ringo. It's an honor to be in Ringo's band. So if he knows ahead of time that Ringo's planning this, then he can plan his tours around that. But... We did hear quite a while ago, and even Todd said it at the camp that I went to uh, over the summer, that Steve Lukather is supposed to be joining Toto. And Toto has a, a really, a bigger, they're a bigger name in Europe in particular. Not that they haven't sold a lot of records here, but they, they are planning a big tour of Europe. And, uh, you know, that is in the cards. And we've heard that Greg Raleigh is supposed to get back with Santana although I don't know for sure if that's going to happen. But it's almost impossible to keep the same musicians time and time again. Right. In fact, one thing that I do remember, just going back to the second all-star band, uh, they were talking about, somebody had asked them, why don't you get these guys in a room and make a studio album together? And Ringo would love to do that. It's just that they're always so busy. Most of, the, of these musicians do tour on a regular basis. So it's hard to pin them down and say, you've got a month or two months to work in the studio. It would actually be great if you think about it. Any of these all-star band lineups, if they ever made a studio album together, but it's difficult to do that. But it is kind of miraculous that he's able to hold on to these same group of guys. And also, since we do know, in fact, you even uh, wrote something in one of your articles that, that Ringo uh, tweeted in the last couple of days that he's working on his new album. Ben Montench is on the new album. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's got some of the same people from the All-Stars 
Uh, I know Steve Lukather is on it and Richard Page is on it. And as we know from uh, an interview that Ringo gave recently, it's supposed to be coming out in March. Since this tour is going to be in February and March, maybe there's a possibility he might work in some of the new songs, which I really hope he does. Yeah. One of the things that um, I noticed when I saw him, you know, a couple months ago is, is that the band, he's really uh, become a lot more comfortable with this band. Uh, you can hear it in the sound of the band. Whereas with past bands, you could tell they weren't, you know, gelling with each other. I mean, they, they were, you know, it was all new and they were all getting used to each other. I mean, they were playing great, but there was, they weren't as comfortable as they are now. There's definitely a feeling that you can hear in the band that there's a, you know, they, they really gel together very well. And that's partly because they've been together for so long, and that's what, what that's doing. Um, and I think that's that's really important. Um, you were talking about Steve Lukather. lukather has been in the studio doing stuff with Toto. So, yeah, I mean, there's a whole lot of things going on around there. Um, and and you, you were talking about Todd. Todd is touring now. He's been tweeting about touring about his his gigs. Uh, he, uh, a week ago, he, he's I guess he was in Massachusetts a week ago. So yeah, I, I mean, I saw him. Yeah, I saw him in New York last oh, week. Oh, did you? So, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. He does a lot of touring all the time. That's a big part of his life. Mm-hmm. You know, he really enjoys doing different types of tours. If you're a Todd fan, you know that. But um, like I said, everybody from all the different all-star band lineups, if they can on a regular basis, they tour. They really enjoy right. it, you know, and, and depending upon, you know, when you become a veteran, uh, in most cases, your records don't sell like they used to. So the major source of your income is from touring. So, yeah. you know, it's it, it would be great if. Uh, Ringo could hold on to a lot of these bands, although at the same time, I do love the changes that are made through the years. But I do think, and I kind of, I agree and I disagree with what you just said about the comfortableness. I think that Ringo's comfortable with most of the of the uh, lineups he's had through the years. They've all been wonderful. But when you do work year after year and you get to know each other really well, as this band has, and I noticed a huge difference the last time I saw this band, that they were so tight. And they were jamming like never before. The jams went on longer for certain songs, especially the Toto mm-hmm. songs and the Santana songs. So, right. um, yeah, I noticed that. But, you know, I, I, Ringo and all the musicians that, that he's worked with have such a mutual respect for each other. I think that you feel that with all the all-star bands. Everybody appreciates uh, the work that all the musicians have done in their careers. And um, I think... You feel that when you go to a Ringo show. And that's the amazing thing is that very often you'll see a lineup of people that on paper may not make much sense. But then when you see Ringo and the All-Stars and they somehow gel no matter what the lineup is, you know, whether whether they're um, transcending many different decades, somehow it all seems to work. But, uh, yeah, I love this lineup. And uh, I would like to see if, if they continue somehow to keep doing this to change the set list a bit. But, um, you know, if Ringo could add some new material, that would be really wonderful. It would be, yeah. It, it, I don't think it will happen, but, yeah, it would be really wonderful. Anyway. Well, when Ringo has a new album out, he usually does one or two songs from the album. That's right. So it, it is possible. And the fact that Steve Lukather and Richard Page are on the album and they're in this band – that should have some influence, I hope. You know, I really don't see, I don't see probably what Ringo would do is take Wings out of the lineup and Anthem, probably. Or maybe keep one of them in and then add one of the new songs or two new songs. But oh, I um, think, I, Ringo... I think, he'll, I think he'll take both of them out I, 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 and put in something from the new album. I don't, he won't hold, I don't think he'll hold over stuff from the, from the, the older album. Not, not, not well, once he, he gets... He has been known to do that. I mean, there are times like with um, Don't Go Where the Road Don't Go. He kept that in several of his tours. It wasn't just when Time Takes Time came out. Okay. You know, there are songs like that that he will do. So on to other news. There's a couple of books in the works that we can talk about, one of which involves Tony Bramwell. 
Right. Tony Bramwell is writing a forward on a book about the Beatles fan club, and this is going to involve uh, – or going to be about Mary Cockrum, who managed the the fan club, um, and they used a fictitious name, Anne Collingham, when they mentioned her in the Beatles Monthly. And um, – and they, that whole thing was supervised by a uh, public relations uh, person, Tony Barrow. But Bramwell, who everybody knows, you know, worked with the Beatles from the beginning and was, you know, head of uh, Apple Records for for a time, uh, is going to be writing the foreword to this. And he, he told me about this. So it's going to be, it, that'll be interesting. There's no date as far as when that's coming out. In fact, uh, the name Ann Collingham, George mentioned in the Beatles' Christmas message, along with Frida Kelly. Mm-hmm. Remember that? Yep. Yep. I do. I do. So, so it's, that's it's just great. I think it's great that they're taking this angle. Again, it's, mm-hmm. it's it's something that hasn't been explored enough. We got a little bit of a taste of it with Frida Kelly's documentary. It's kind of interesting when I read your article there that when Tony Brownwell spoke about it, it never mentions Frida at all. Right. So I don't really know, we don't really know if Frida will be involved, but it is, it's going to be mainly about other central figures, like you right. mentioned, Mary Cochran. Right. Then there's the Apple Records book. There's a, a book coming out on um, Apple Records that's going to be kind of a, a book for uh, collectors, really, because it's going to have really deep information about uh the workings of Apple Records, the the releases of Apple Records, um, the non-Apple Records releases that Apple Records was involved in. I mean, it's going to go really deep into all sorts of stuff. That's going to uh, start to, – they're already taking orders for it, and that should be – I think the first volume is going to be out in a couple months. The, what I gathered from reading your article about this is that – and this is what <laughs> – fascinates me the most is that it's not necessarily just about Apple Records. It's about all the divisions of Apple, right? Right. It's going to be about it. It's going to be a very wide-ranging book. So there'll be news about the boutique. There'll be news about Apple Publishing. So mm-hmm. that that all, you know, it, it's, it, again, we're talking about books here where it's really going into detail about, you know, there'll be a lot of information here that we probably have never been aware of. Mm-hmm. So... Between that and the fan club, I'm very interested in both those books. But right. who, are, who, are the, who is the author or authors of, of this book? There's three authors. There's Axel Corinth, Ed Dietman, and Antonio Caracelli. And they're from three countries. Axel's from Germany, Dietman's from the Netherlands, and Antonio Caracelli is from Italy. So it's three Europeans working on this. Okay, so, so there will be several volumes from what I've read. Mm-hmm. Yep. You can pre-order it now, correct? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Um, the ordering address is order at a is for Apple book dot com, and volume one is about uh, seventy dollars at a at the current exchange rates, uh, fifty five euros. And if you order it before December first, you get a five dollar. Five, you get a five euro discount, which amounts to about six dollars and thirty cents. So. Okay. All right. Really, that's uh, I I love the ideas of both those books, mm-hmm. and just to find out about well, just the, the records part, which I'm sure most people most of their interest will probably be in the music. So to know all the releases when they came out, what didn't come out, the albums, the singles, the stories behind them, that'll be most interesting. You know, so I'm looking forward to that. You know. Oh, I was okay. going to say the first the first volume is going to hit the the beginnings with Lennon and McCartney's first solo projects, How I Won the War, and uh, Family Way, and the beginnings of Apple Publishing, retail and electronics. So. Okay, that's good. All right, something that's far more um, complete when it comes to the history of Apple. Mm-hmm. So it'll probably fill in a lot of holes for people that don't know the entire history and lots of information that probably has never been uh, discovered before. Right. So, and there's a new book that's been getting quite a lot of press lately, and it's uh, by Glenn Johns, 
the producer. And it's called Sound Man. And for those of you that don't know, Glenn Johns has worked with everyone from the Beatles, Rolling Stones, the Eagles, Paul and Wings, uh, Steve Miller, Eric Clapton, so many great people in the hierarchy of rock. Brad Stewart in the faces. And he's still active as a producer. And in fact, uh, many of us know that on Paul's album, New, he's been working with his son, Ethan, as a producer. But, right. um, but Glenn has said in the book, there's a few revelations there pertaining to the Beatles. One of which, the one that's gotten the most attention, is that he is saying that Bob Dylan asked Glenn Johns to uh, put together an album in which Bob would work with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones together for the same album. And, uh, you know, what it eventually happened was they, they, um, they didn't agree to this, especially Mick and, uh, and Paul were dead set against doing this. Yeah, that didn't happen. But in this case, it was, it was, it never really got off the ground. I mean, it was an idea that Dylan had and he threw it out and it didn't go any further. I believe Lennon, I believe John Lennon actually kind of liked the idea, but, or George Harrison liked the idea, which wouldn't be a surprise. But, mm. uh, it never really got off the ground and I think the story got blown much bigger than it really needed to be because it really never, it never got pa past the the uh, the Dylan stage, and you know nobody really, you know. I mean, Harrison. You can he, you can figure that Harrison probably would have been interested, but it never really took off. There was a there's a uh, interesting uh, you know uh, some people might remember way back in the 70s there was an album called Masked Marauders. You, you ever hear mm. that? Sure. Um, that was not. Uh, that purported to be the Beatles, the Stones, and Dylan, but was not. It was it was completely fake. Rolling Stone actually kind of um, played along with the gag at one point and had people believe in it, but then they revealed that it really wasn't any of them. And it was. And I had the album for uh, uh, I had the vinyl album, and it was actually released on CD by um, Rhino Handmade. I don't think it's available anymore, unfortunately. But I mean, it wasn't a an, it wasn't a horrible album. It was actually kind of interesting. Although I remember one of the songs uh, that one of the songs was, believe it or not, uh, Mick Jagger sang a song that uh, the title was "Can't Get No Nookie." I swear to God, that was the title. <laughs> and and um, I can I can still hear him singing it because I remember hearing that uh, album many times. But. Um, you know, it wasn't a fantastic album, and of course it wouldn't have been because it was a parody, but, you know, the idea that, I, I, I'm not sure I'd really want to have heard the three of them get together, because with all the egos clashing, uh, um, it would have been, it would have been strange, I think, back then, but you have to wonder if maybe that germ of an idea that Dylan had had something to do with the Wilburys, who knows, um, you're talking so far long before the Wilburys ever happened, so... No, but, I mean, you know, sure, I certainly certainly, it's a long time, but, you know, he may have held on to the idea, and, you know, and, and once he got, you know, friendly with George, really friendly with George, they might have, you know, he might have, that might have been where that came from, maybe even a little bit, you know, you don't, we don't know. I'm just saying, it's interesting that... You know, if he had that idea back in the 60s, maybe the Wilburys, had, maybe it had a, just a little bit to do with the Wilburys. Who knows? Maybe it didn't. I don't know. I don't know. It may be a stretch. It may not. But, um, you know, just the mere fact that, that Dylan thought about this, I found to be interesting. And well, apparently uh, both bands expressed varying degrees of interest in this. But mm -hmm. apparently it was, only, it was only Mick and Paul that didn't want to do it. Well, they in particular, the most, didn't want to do it. But right. when you think and, about the fact that you know that the Beatles were big fans of Dylan. So, but at the time, there was so much going on. There was so much activity back then. You know, between, all, between the Beatles and the Stones and Dylan, they were so busy around that time. So, uh, who knows? I still, think, <laughs> I still think the story got blown a lot, uh, out of proportion. Because I remember seeing one headline, 
you know, when somebody wrote it up as saying, you know, it, it, it was basically inferring that it almost happened. It came very close to happening. And it really didn't come that close to happening. I mean, these kind of things, you know, I'm sure there's dozens of examples all the way down the line, you know, that of things like this where people had ideas. Oh, you know, maybe I'll work with, you know, be nice to work with such and such. And, you know, and it was just an idea that never got anywhere. And this never got really anywhere. So I don't know. Mm. Okay. You can take I, that. You can go with that as you want to. But anyway. And also, Glenn John says that after Sergeant Pepper came out, Mick Jagger went to him and said, you've got to come up with some new sounds because Sergeant Pepper has just uh, reinvented the wheel. So uh, interesting little comment from Mick Jagger there. And it's funny that they tried to do their own Sergeant Pepper. Uh, the That's Stone true. Kid. So, I mean, for reinventing the wheel, they sure he sure copied what they were doing. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, but this is just the, the recollections of Glenn Johns in the book. And right. he also says, and I found this kind of interesting, not that shocking, but um, when Led Zeppelin first emerged on the scene, Glenn Johns was kind of blown away by them. He was just, it was a jaw-dropping moment for, for Glenn Johns. And um, when the music was played to both Mick Jagger and George Harrison, they didn't like the music, <laughs> and Glenn Johns was, was really shocked about it. He was disappointed that Mick and George really didn't get Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, to each his own, I suppose. Look what Led Zeppelin became. So, right. Um, you know, and he right. also says that um, it was his idea, it was Glenn Johns' idea for the Beatles to play on the Apple rooftop, and he also says that um, while the Let It Be sessions – were a difficult time for the band. He also remembers that they really had a good time together and they were hysterically funny, he says, and uh, just ordinary blokes. It wasn't all just misery all the time during the Let It Be sessions. You know, I, 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 I would question the, content, the uh, him saying that he it was his idea to play up on the Apple rooftop because, as I recall from the movie, they talked with Michael Lindsay Hogg about that, right? Mm. I mean, that was part of that discussion. So I, right. I, I would very much question that in particular. But I have not read the book yet. I'm going to have to. That's going to be something I'm going to have to get a hold of. But yeah, I uh, haven't either. But I'm just reading excerpts that have been online from what's in the book. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, only the the Beatles related stuff is what I'm relaying here on the show. So right. Right. Um, let's see, what else did we want to discuss? Um, well, I wanted to bring up, because just before doing this show right now with you, I had a chance to listen to the interview that Olivia Harrison gave to Jules Holland on BBC okay. Radio. And we were just talking about this because it got some attention because she played a one-minute um, excerpt of a demo that George made for the song called Fear of Flying which was right. a song that the uh, British artist Charlie Dore recorded. But she talked, uh, it was a really good interview. And Jules Holland does great interviews and, you know, the whole history with him and the Beatles. You know, you gotta, yeah. you got to give some uh, credit to him because he interviewed the Beatles, the three surviving Beatles for the Beatles anthology. And he right. worked with George on Horse to the Water. So, right. and I, I must say before I even bring this up that Jules Holland hosted a radio special when Brainwash came out, which was absolutely wonderful. It's one of the best specials I've ever heard. It was just everything you'd ever want to know about the songs on Brainwash. And it involved interviews with Olivia and Danny Harrison. And uh, Jeff Lynn is on there, Jim Keltner. Um, I believe Ray Cooper may have been on there, but it was just so good. So, you know, Jules Holland has done a lot of extraordinary work with the Beatles. And so for this particular interview, Olivia was on, obviously, to promote the George Harrison box set, the Apple Years. And so she was just talking about her life with George, and they were playing excerpts of songs and songs in their entirety. They played some of Electronic Sound. They played the track Skiing from uh, Wonderwall Music. And, uh, well, because Eric Clapton's on there. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. it's a funny thing about Skiing, because it must be a favorite in the Harrison 
household there because a few years ago there were ringtones that came out on George's music, and that was one of them mm-hmm. for skiing. One of the tracks, some one of the instrumental tracks, a rock track that Clapton was on. But um, yeah, I wonder, how many, talking, they, I wonder how many they sold to that. <laughs> I don't know. The, I guess the real, you know, the hardcore Harrison fans knew the song. But um, yeah, it, it was a really good interview. Some of the things that I found interesting, uh, although this is not the first time it's been brought up, I think it was in the Beatles anthology. Uh, Olivia talked about how George told her that, uh, the, well, the first song that George ever remembered hearing was a song called One Meatball by um, this a black singer, songwriter, guitar player. He was a civil activist, too. He was in blues and jazz, and his name was Josh White, and they played the song. So I think when you, when you really want to appreciate an artist and get to know the artist and what influenced them, you got to hear the music that they heard growing up. And it's not just, I know it's easy to think in the case of the Beatles, they're so well known for their hits and their pop stuff and their love for 50s rock and roll, which no doubt was a massive influence on them, but their influences go far beyond that. And there's quite a lot that's pre-rock and roll, and all the Beatles love that. I mean, Ringo did Sentimental Journey, and we know Paul just did Kisses on the Bottom a few years ago, and that right. George recorded Hoagie Carmichael songs in his solo, solo career. He recorded Cole Porter. He loved that stuff, and you know he loved George Formby, right. the ukulele player. But, you know, you got a little taste of some of the early stuff. They played, speaking of Hoagie Carmichael, they played Stardust, which Hoagie co-wrote. He, he wrote the music for that. But a version that George loved was one before the lyrics were ever written. And it was an instrumental version that Hoagie Carmichael recorded, and I think the year was 1927, and they played it. So it's yeah. really cool. It's, it's kind of like, you know, John Lennon's jukebox in a way. Only it's applying it towards George. And one right. thing that Olivia said in the interview that I found interesting, because we all have wondered, and we just talked about this, how much is there in the archives from George? How much unreleased stuff is there? As if we're ever going to really know the full extent of that. But she did say there's a lot of unfinished songs. Okay? Mm-hmm. So you got to wonder what would they do with that? <laughs> Right. You know, it's it's got to be a daunting task to go through everything that's unreleased of George's career. And according to Olivia, he recorded quite a lot of stuff. And what would you do with an unrele- with an unfinished song? That's far right. more complicated than a song that is where he's made a demo and it could just go out as a demo if it's a complete song. What do you do with songs where you just got fragments or they're not complete? So that I found rather interesting. But uh, I know that Jules asked. Olivia, if George was a workaholic, and she said yes, although, you know, you can interpret that a number of ways. It doesn't mean that he was a workaholic when it came to his music. He had his own studio. I'm sure he did a lot more recording than we're aware of, but he had other interests like gardening, and for him to spend a whole day in the garden, you know, that could have been work. That's what he could perceive as work, too, but I found that to be interesting, but, you know, she gave us a little teaser with that one minute excerpt of Fear of Flying, and you got to wonder how much lies in the vaults. But um, I also am a firm believer of being a businessman and never putting out everything all at once. And it's still got to be a lot of work just to comb through everything and find out what the best material is and what, right. and to put yourself in the mindset of Olivia or Danny and what is the best material and what would George approve of. You know, that kind of thing. It's very complicated. I was just thinking about this when she was when she mentioned unfinished songs, because when Brainwash came out, Danny and and Jeff Lynne were talking about how George pretty much laid out the rules of what he wanted in the song, or at least he gave them an idea of where the songs would go. So they knew that for those songs, but they may not know that for the unreleased stuff for the for the unfinished songs. So you got to wonder if that's ever going to see the light of day. But um, I'm sure everything's going to be done with a lot of uh, care. And, and um, you know, it's 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 not they're not easy decisions to make. So uh, just interesting to know what Olivia had to say. Olivia and both Danny, they're great interviews. I think they kind of learn from George a lot because they don't give many interviews. But when they do, they're powerful. Well, yeah, this interview, by the way, is online. It's on the BBC site. 
if you Google Olivia Harrison and Jules Holland, you should be able to find it pretty easily. And as I uh, write today, Wednesday, it'll be up for seven more days. Wednesday is when we're taping this. So it's going to be up, uh, say, through next Tuesday, through the 18th. So um, if you you know if you want to hear it, it's a 57 minute interview. If you want to hear it, you, you know make sure you get to it before next Tuesday, late next Tuesday. Well, I would highly recommend listening to this because uh, what they do try to bring out in this interview is that during the course of these years, the Apple years from 68 through 75, that George really was uh, experimental. And his musical tastes are far more eclectic, I think, than people, most people are aware of, because he did all the Indian stuff, not just with the Beatles, but on Wonderwall music. He dabbled in the electronic music when it was just starting to come out with the Moog synthesizer, which the Beatles also <laughs> used. But, you know, to do a whole album the way he did on electronic sound, to some people they may find it interesting. Some people might think it's far too experimental or, you know, too free form for them. But the fact that he even did it and recognized it is something that, you know, we should take note of and, and appreciate. And just the fact that he did all the different things on Apple, working with all the different artists, he actually did more, not to take away anything from the other Beatles, but he did more in terms of producing other artists and helping other artists than any of the other Beatles did on Apple. When you think about Jackie Lomax and Billy Preston and Doris Troy. And they also played Billy's recording of All Things Must Pass, which really I hadn't heard for a while, but it's really a very striking, unique uh -huh. arrangement of that song. It's, it was really well done. So, um, you know, when you, when you put it all together, and obviously everyone's going to look at All Things Must Pass and it was such a great album and it was a, a crowning achievement. But you look at everything else and you get a much fuller perspective and appreciation for everything that George was doing during that time. And, uh, of course, mentioning the concert for Bangladesh as well. A very active period it was for George for, for uh, those seven years. All right, so that brings this show to a close. I want to thank all of you for listening. And if you want to get in touch with us by email, our address is Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. And if you want to get in touch with me directly, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. If you want to comment about this show or uh, make some suggestions for the show, uh, we welcome your comments. And uh, by all means, if you can, please look at my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. Tell us about all the things that I'm doing uh, as far as Beatle work is concerned with my show, Every Little Thing, and this one, and there's trivia and interviews on the website, so... And I have a Facebook page, too, so please friend me. Steve? And you can get a hold of me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. And I'm on Facebook I'm under my own name. And um, I also have a Beatle news group called Beatle News and Commentary where I, I post uh, stories and all sorts of interesting things. And um, so look for me there and, uh, you know, get, old, get a hold of me. And I'm, all, I'm just all over the place. I'm... So busy writing, I'm just, I'm everywhere. So, what can I say? So, for the Beatles, things we said today, I'm Ken Michaels, thanking all of you for listening, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci for things we said today, saying we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.